Call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time is now 6 o'clock. If you will please join me in standing, Mr. Moore is going to lead us in the invocation. If you're so inclined, would you please bow with me? God, you truly are the God of all people, in all places, at all times. We pause now as we set about the business of this district to invoke your blessing on our conversations and our decisions that we are to make tonight. God, this week, perhaps above all else, we give you thanks for those brave men and women who have stepped forward in the call to service of this country those who have been willing to stand in harm's way for us, that we might live in a land of democracy and, and celebrate the types of freedoms that we enjoy each and every day, even the freedom to disagree. God, as we move into this Thanksgiving holiday season, we give you thanks for all the blessings you have poured out upon us and all those that are yet to come, for we know that all that we have comes from you. As our families travel this time of year, we pray for your blessing of safety to be upon them, your hand of mercy to take them to their destination, to provide them with a time of rest and refreshment, and to return them safely to the schools that love them. We give you thanks for all those whom you have called to be educators, to help raise young men and young women, to teach them not just academics, but the ways of the world, that they might be productive citizens. God, we pray for your guidance upon this meeting. Help us see your will for the students, the families, the employees, and those who reside within the boundaries of this district. Help us to be faithful servants of all that they have entrusted us with. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please uh, continue standing. We are going to have the presentation of colors from the Woodlands Air Force uh, Junior ROTC under the direction of Chief Rick Robinson, uh, Commander Mich uh, Mitchell Coxton, Sadie Gilling, Texas Flag, Jordan Pimentel, right guard, Sheb Walsh, left guard. <coughs> And then we have some kids coming up to lead us in the pledge. Kids, come on up. Okay, guys, we have a special treat today. So our, our U.S. and Texas flags will be led by some Buckaloo and uh, Darigen students, of which from Darigen we have Ms. Ashlyn Reeves, uh, Mr. Parker Reeves, as well as from Buckaloo we have Macy Price. So if you guys would do us the honor. Ladies, gents. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, leave us in Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Great job. <coughs> Thank you all. All right, item 2A, Special District Recognitions, uh, Connor ISD National Merit Scholarship Student Recognitions. Dr. Knoll. All right, Mr. Colshan, you please present this item. <clears throat> President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, and Dr. Knoll. It is an honor and privilege to stand before you tonight to honor and congratulate a very special group of students. In October of 2017, over 1.6 million juniors in over 22,000 high schools across the United States took the preliminary SAT, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. 
Based upon their scores on this test, students are identified and honored through the National Merit Scholarship Competition. Tonight, we are recognizing the Conroe ISD seniors who have met the requirements to be named a National Merit Semifinalist. National Merit Semifinalists are the top 1% of high school seniors and have the opportunity to continue in the competition for scholarships. Of the approximately 16,000 semifinalists nationally, about 15,000 will be named as National Merit Finalists in the spring and be eligible for 8,000 scholarships worth more than $30 million. We're very proud of the students with us tonight for their academic accomplishments. While we are honored to say that our teachers and staff have played an important role in this accomplishment, we would certainly be remiss not to recognize the importance of so many other people who've played equally important parts. First and foremost, the guidance and support that students receive from home is the cornerstone of success on which schools are able to build. The opportunities that you have provided your children over the years are key ingredients to academic success. Parents, Thank you for being here tonight to celebrate this very special accomplishment and for the support you have given our schools in working with your children. If you're a parent of a semifinalist, please stand to be recognized. <laughs> Students, thank you for the, com the commitment that you've made to learning. The lessons that you have learned that have allowed you to be here tonight will serve you well throughout your life and provide you with the same type of success you have experienced. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce our coordinator of guidance and counseling, Denise Cipolla, who will introduce our National Merit Semifinalists. Students, please come forward when you are introduced. Colson's going to hand it to you. Good evening. Nicole Beeler. Jill Bonet. Christopher Kalisi. Michael Cow, <laughs> Genevieve Childers, <laughs> Ankit Chowdhury. Joba Dasari, <clears throat> Neha Deshmuk, <clears throat> Sonia He. Rose Hertigergen. Sarah Kong. Connor Kunthapanya. Michelle Lang. <laughs> Sathija Manage. <laughs> Jessica Myers. <laughs> Dominique O'Neill. Kelly Shin. Sebastian Vasquez. Yeah. 
Abby versus Flyveld. I would just like to say a few things on behalf of the board, how proud we are of y'all. Um, many people don't know, but the National Scholar Program has been around since 1955, and I will tell y'all that this moment and this, this award will stay with you. It will always be on your resume and your CV, and that is extremely important. And I want to echo uh, what Dr. Colson said, that uh, we're just so blessed. Our, our talent pool is so rich and deep here at Conroe Independent School District, and, and not only is it a credit to the hard work and the hours that you guys have put in and your studying and just the sacrifices that you have made, but also the sacrifices and the efforts of all you parents out there of making sure they're getting their homework done, making sure they're working on that analysis and critical thinking and all those skills that have brought them uh, tonight. And also uh, to our educators, Every, I'm sure y'all can think back of kindergarten, and second grade, and fifth grade, and all those teachers that made such a, a big impact and a difference in your lives and really challenged you to uh, just push forward academically, and this is a great uh, result and, a, and a, just a, a great testimony of, of the results of those efforts. And so on behalf of the Board of Trustees and all of the district, we congratulate you, we are proud of you, and we just hope you have a wonderful holiday next week. <laughs> Looks like everybody got the memo, but this is a time if you want to go congratulate your National Merit uh, student, please feel free to go do so at this time. Our next item is item 2B, Special District Recognition, 2018 UIL 6A Boys Cross Country State Champions, the Woodlands High School Cross Country Team. Dr. Knoll. Well, this is a, a very special night, and uh, this has become a, a bit of a tradition here. Uh, in the month of November to, to celebrate our cross-country team from the Woodlands High School. But uh, the next three items will actually be a celebration of the Woodlands Feeder, mm -hmm. um, and we're really proud to have that. I want to say a special thank you to our bagpipe uh, players. <laughs> uh, it might have been the first board meeting ever. So yes. Right? <laughs> Pretty impressive. Uh, but to celebrate our cross-country team, I'm going to ask Dr. Landry to come forward and uh, introduce the team, please. Good evening. Thank you, President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Knoll. Uh, thank you all very much for the opportunity for us to recognize and celebrate these fantastic young men. Um, as you know, winning a state title in any athletic event in uh, in 6A in the state of Texas is exceedingly difficult. Uh, and this, these young men have done just that. And it's through their dedication and their willingness to literally put in the miles uh, that they have been able to accomplish this. And uh, we couldn't be more proud of them, uh, of who they are, and what they've been able to do. So it's my, uh, my pleasure to introduce their, uh, their head coach, who will introduce you to them, um, the Woodlands High School head boys cross-country coach, Coach Juris Green. All right. 
right, Dr. Noel, members of the board, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, it being a Woodlands feeder school evening um, makes it even more special oh, yeah. to be surrounded by Highlander faithful. Uh, uh, we're just we're just really happy to be here. Uh, we were here a year ago. Uh, mm -hmm. celebrating the exact same thing, a, a, a state title, actually number 20 for our program. Um, we graduated six from that team, brought back one sophomore from last year. And if any of you would have oh. told me that we would be back here again or you had some confidence that we would be back here again celebrating another state title, I would say you're the only one in the room who believed that. <laughs> we have uh, confidence you'll be back next year. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it out there. <laughs> we, we started the year, well, with one returner, four JV runners who had never run varsity before, and two sophomores who had never run 5K before, because freshmen only run two miles. Uh, Preseason, we're ranked 12th in the state of Texas. But these guys just went to work. They got better. They made mistakes. They got better. They kept learning, and they got better. And we got to November 3rd in Round Rock and had a chance. And that in of itself is an accomplishment. Uh, when the gun went off at 9, 10 a.m. on November 3rd, and all of our Highlanders crossed the line, we recorded of the seven Highlanders, seven personal best runs over 5,000 meters. Uh -oh. And our program's 21st state title in 40 consecutive trips to the state meet. Um, we're no longer the 12th ranked team in the state of Texas. <laughs> we're now number one, but we're also number 16 in the United States. Woo! And it just goes. Uh, <laughs> so I'd like to introduce. I'd like to introduce our team, uh, my assistant coach, Chris Bales. Our third place finisher individually in his first varsity season, Spencer Cardinal. Another top 10 finisher in the state, placing ninth in his second varsity season, junior Ethan Hammer. Another junior, Aaron Saltman. <laughs> Sophomore, Joshua English. <laughs> Sophomore, Matthias Monanen. <laughs> junior, Ben Amundsen. <laughs> and finally, Sophomore, Brian Sewell. with them, Coach Green. I just have a short quote. You know, it's tough when you try to find something to say as a board member to a team that's had six titles, 40, 40 trips to the state meet. But I found a, a, a great author, Mark Sanborn, had a famous quote, and I'd like to read it to you. It says, the greatest danger of a, te a team faces isn't that it won't become successful, but that it will and then cease to improve. One of the things that y'all have done and continue to do is continue to improve the program year after year after year. You continue on a legacy, and I'm gonna call it that, a legacy of winning and a tradition at the Woodlands High School and being Highlanders. And I just wanna say congratulations and thank you. And on behalf of Highlander Nation, we're gonna call it tonight, we appreciate all that you do for representing the Woodlands High School in Conroe ISD. Congratulations. 
And just just for the record, uh, he didn't leave the seniors at home tonight. There are no seniors on that team. That state champion team will all be returning next year. So. All right. Item uh, 2C is another special district recognition, the Woodlands High School UIL Class 6A Lone Star Cup winner. Well, we are Knoll. excited to celebrate the Lone Star Cup championship. We uh, attempted to do this a few months ago. Yeah. We had some uh, lighting problems, lighting some power problems power here in the, yes. in the boardroom. But this uh, is a very significant accomplishment, and it, and it deserved to be uh, recognized and get its due recognition. So here to present will be Dr. Landry once again. <laughs> evening thanks for coming back <laughs> thanks for having us back um, uh, president bush members of the board the board of trustees dr Noel, um it is my privilege to be able to um, recognize uh, the woodlands high school's winning of the uil lone star cup um, as you know the lone star cup rewards the best overall academic athletic and music programs in the state of texas uh, to win every student every coach every teacher across all areas of UIL competition must contribute. Uh, with state championships in boys cross country, girls swimming and diving, boys track and field, a state runner up in boys swimming and diving, state bronze medalist in girls golf and volleyball, and additional points earned in team tennis, football, girls and boys basketball, girls and boys soccer, softball and baseball, the Highlanders finished the 2017-18 school year with 117 total UIL Lone Star Cup points. Uh, this is the second consecutive UIL Lone Star mm -hmm. Cup victory for the Woodlands High School and is the school's seventh overall award, which is the most of any 6A high school in the state of Texas. Um, this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, accomplishment. The competition is tremendous and, uh, and it's very difficult and it takes a very well-rounded school um, to win this award and to be able to do it as often as the Woodlands has uh, is a credit to everyone uh, in uh, in the feeder pattern as well as the coaches. We do have some coaches here that I'd like to uh, to recognize and here to introduce them to us uh, is the Woodlands High School Assistant Athletic Director and Head Girl Soccer Coach, Coach Dina Graves. Good evening. Um, we're very excited to be here. Uh, Coach Rapp and a lot of our staff um, have games and stuff tonight. Okay. So I just wanted to um, let y'all know that we're uh, on a great run to get started for this next year, too. So I'm going to introduce the coaches that are here. First, we have Terry Wade. She is our girls volleyball coach. And then we have Jeremy Wade. He is our boys uh, swimming and diving coach. Noel Hansen is our girls cross country and track. Jason Fanning, boys soccer. Tim Bortz, softball. And Ron Eastman, baseball. And certainly it is last to hear, but not least, <laughs> Juris Green. Boys cross country and track. And like I said, it is a team effort, um, and I can tell, I speak for all of our staff that we are um, very supportive of each other. Um, when we're able to, even with our families and everything, we try to do everything we can to support each other. Um, we appreciate the community um, and the school board and all the principals and everybody that helps us with the faculty and the parents as well. Um, we're on a good roll this year, getting ready. Um, volleyball had a great run. Um, obviously, football made the playoffs. Of course, our state championship. Um, team tennis has done very well, too, making it to regionals. So we're on our way to um, a great start for this year. I've looked long and hard for quotes. <laughs> the great coach, Vince Lombardi, uh, who won five NFL championships in the first two Super Bowls that were ever played, had a quote that I really thought hit home. It said, the only place that success comes before working hard is in the dictionary. <laughs> the Woodlands High School has done an excellent job, and I want to thank each and every one of you for all of your successes 
and the great uh, attitude that you instill in all of our athletes and basically in all of our students that attend the Woodlands High School, we appreciate it. You're making men and women out of students that are going to be the future for all of us. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of the board and, again, on behalf of the Highland Nation. Thank you. Highlander Nation, thank you. Next up is something we actually um, started last month and has been uh, absolutely wonderful. And I, I'm going to take the moment as, as my final board meeting. This is incredibly special to me. So special district recognition, the Woodlands High School Feeder Zone. Let us continue with the Highlander celebration. Yeah. Dr. Landry, if you would, please. Good, good evening. <laughs> good late evening. You're getting, getting I'm, getting I'm getting comfortable. I'm getting comfortable up here. President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, uh, Dr. Noel, um, it is my it's my honor to stand here tonight uh, to introduce you to the the Woodlands Feeder Schools. Um, you know, you've seen some of the excellence that comes out of that feeder system, um, and I say it like that for a reason because those kids don't get to the high school by chance, ready to do what they do. They get there because of the fantastic feeder schools that are in the area. Um, you know, it's a true partnership that we have, and uh, I'm new to that partnership. But I can tell you that the principal meetings, the feeder meetings that I've been able to go to have been true highlights for me. Um, the energy that's in that room, those dedicated professionals, they have fun. Um, but their goals are always about students, about student success, um, and it's about community, belonging to a community, contributing to a community, uh, and being a partner within that community because that success, that excellence that you've just seen and that, that we know as the Woodlands Feeder Schools doesn't happen just with a school system. It happens with a full community, and that's what we have. Um, and I'm getting to witness that, and it's very refreshing. Um, and I'm having a great time. The other principals, uh, they don't, they don't, they were like, don't, we don't want to go up there and say anything. So I'm going to say it for them. They are fantastic people, uh, and it's been my privilege to be able to work with them um, here just recently. And I look forward to many, many more of those meetings to come. Um, so I hope tonight we can give you a little insight into what the Woodlands Feeder Schools are all about and the fantastic students that we get to serve each and every day. Okay, thank you. The Woodlands Feeder Zone is home to a unique community that consistently works together to make living, working, and learning in the Woodlands an award-winning opportunity. In 1976, the Conroe Independent School District opened its second feeder zone with the building of McCullough High School. In 1996, CISD opened the Woodlands High School with the growth in the area. The Woodlands High School is the current holder of the UIL Lone Star Cup. This is the seventh time the Woodlands has earned the prestigious award, which is the most of any 6A school in the state of Texas. This award is in large part due to the state championship teams from girls swimming and diving, boys cross country, and the boys track team. Without the support from both the community and the feeder schools, awards such as the Lone Star Cup would be unattainable. Here is just a sample of how the community and the Woodlands feeder campuses interact daily.
thank you for the opportunity to show you how the Woodlands Feeder Zone and the community work together to make an impact on the students of CISD. Good evening, President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, and Dr. Knoll. My name is Jill Malpass Hauser, and I'm the principal at the Woodlands High School ninth grade campus. I became a Highlander back in the eighth grade in 1976 when McCullough opened. As a proud member of the third graduating class of McCullough High School, it is my privilege to introduce the principals of the Woodlands Feeder Zone. Principals, if you would stand and come up and be recognized when I call your name. Jill Price, Buckaloo Elementary. Judy Mills, Bush Elementary. <laughs> Alicia Reeves, Darachin Elementary. <laughs> Danae Wilker, Gladys Elementary. <laughs> Cassie Hertzenberg, Glenlock Elementary. <laughs> Sean Cresswell, Colson Tuff Elementary. Paula Klopeski, Mitchell Intermediate. Chris McCord, McCullough Junior High. And Dr. Ted Landry, The Woodlands High School. As you could probably tell from our video, the Woodlands Feeder Schools are actively involved in many activities that give back to our community. The Woodlands High School is particularly proud of our improv group who supports various charities, a different charity every month through their popular performances. Through all the shows, they have collected over $130,000 in five years. They are here to perform for you tonight one of their sensational acts. Without further ado, I give you Matthew Peters and his talented improv team. Yeah. 
made in that cocoon, it's a butterfly! <laughs> I'm sad right now, so I'm going to cry! That was okay. <laughs> like all these men, I'm wearing a tie! You're not wearing a tie. <laughs> I'm going to lay, but it's in the past tense, so Why? I'm Why? <laughs> I'm not a girl, I'm a guy! <laughs> this isn't the truth, this is a lie! <laughs> It's my favorite bread. It's rye. <laughs> the opposite of sell. It's I. <laughs> Popular scientist. His name is Bill. Not. <laughs> this is low, whereas this is high. <laughs> I'm super cool, man. I'm fly. <laughs> say my daughter was in a play at McCullough and almost all of you I believe were there Thursday night and were cheering them on and I gotta say that's a wonderful thing about this feeder zone that our high school students came back and were cheering on and supporting their younger students really impressed me as a parent so thank y'all for doing that Hi, good evening, uh, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Null. It's such a privilege to be part of the Woodlands High School Feeder Zone and to be here tonight to recognize so many of our boys and girls who are making an impact on the community. Tonight, I'm proud to introduce you to several of our sixth grade students who are part of the Kindness Rocks Challenge at Darichin. Hi, I'm Bailey Venar. Last year, our sixth graders began the Kindness Rocks at Darichin project. <laughs> This project is meant to help spread kindness and encouragement to others. They painted and wrote encouraging words and on over 200 rocks which were placed in front of our school by the flagpole. Hi, I'm Ashley Moe. This year our goal is to grow our kindness rocks garden and spread these rocks into our community. Every student in our school will have an opportunity to create a rock to place in our garden. Hello, I'm Jaden Ackerman. These rocks aren't meant to just be admired. They are meant to grow a culture of kindness. The garden is marked with a large rock that invites our families and community to take one, share one, and bring one back to help our garden grow. Hi, I'm Maida. We know that one single rock with a single message seems to be a small act, but we've learned two things. Kindness multiplies and the perfect rock will always find the perfect person. <laughs> Hi, I am Amatula Kosawala. We'd like to present each of you today with a kindness rock. Thank you for all you do for us and for our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. That's job, awesome. guys. Thank you. Thank you. President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Null, I'm Chris McCord. I'm principal here at McCullough Junior High School. I'm here tonight to tell you a little bit, along with Grace Crestwell, about a, one of the flagship events we do at McCullough Junior High each year. And it is, uh, we have evolved over the years. You may know about the Children in Santa's Dreams, which is an acronym for CISD Toy Drive, which provides many toys for DD students in our area. Over the years, we've been active through the McCullough Charity League and organizations within our building. And it has evolved to where part of what we do <laughs> in the major niche we have of the drive is providing bicycles for the community. Grace Cresswell, I'm happy to have her with me, about to my left, and she is going to tell you about it. She is an eighth grade student at McCullough. 
and she is also a member of the 2018-2019 CISD Student Leadership Academy. So without further ado, I give you Grace Cresswell. I'm a college junior high. We participate in the CISD Children in St. Anne's Dreams Project. Every year, our McCullough Charity League and many other amazing organizations work hard for our niche to donate bikes. Last year, we donated over 200 new bikes to needy students in our area. If you would like to donate a bike, you may do so through our front office um, up to December 7th. Um, following the bike parade, we are following the bike drive. We have a bike parade. Um, this is used to showcase um, how proud of we are for our students who are stepping up to donate bikes to our school. This bike parade this year will occur on Friday, December 7th at 8 a.m. on our campus. Um, we would love for you to join us. Thank you so much for your time today. I was so happy to be able to present or to tell you about such an amazing program we have at our school used to help students in our area. We hope you can join us this year. Thanks, Grace. President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, uh, while I have the mic, I'll say, Melanie, we will miss you terribly, and thank you for your altruism. I'm here to present the PI, Patrons Influencing Education Award, and I would like to introduce Carol Durkee. The Durkee family moved here in June of 1997. In August of that year, her oldest, Ross, started kindergarten, and Carol began her journey with Conroe Independent School District. This is her 22nd year to serve on a CISD PTA PTO board. When she had a child attending a school, she served on that school's PTA PTO board. Three of those years, she served on three school boards. In one year, she was on four boards. As a former teacher, she knows how lucky she is that her children were able to attend CISD schools. She is also blessed that her daughter, Madison, teaches in this wonderful school district at Powell Elementary. Carol served at Bush Elementary for 10 years. She served as PTA president for two years, PTA secretary, PTA school supplies chairman, PTA annual carnival committee, grade level room mom, site-based committee, camp Bush coordinator for second grade level, a week-long event of activities. She decorated the school for uh, the stage backdrop for numerous events. She was a PTA vice president of programs, PTA parliamentarian, PTA staff appreciation chairman, PTA nominating chairman. <laughs> Good evening. Carol Durkee is a very busy woman. She spent three years in our community at Gladys Elementary, and during her time there, she served as a PTO Staff Appreciation Chair, a PTO Spring Getty Decoration Chair, the PTO School Supplies Chairperson, and the PTO Hospitality Chairperson. In addition to that, she also served consecutive to the excuse me, consecutively as a room parent at Gladys Elementary. So she's very busy indeed, and thank you, Carol, for all your hard work. She spent seven years at Mitchell Intermediate School as PTO Staff Appreciation Chair, PTO Reflections Chair, Site-Based Committee, decorating the sixth grade end of the year celebration, the LC5 Student Volunteer Club organizer, organizer the PTO School Supplies Chair, PTO Nominating Chair, Grade Level Socials. Then moved on to Branch Crossing in McCullough, where she spent seven years as PTO President for two years, PTO School Supplies Chair, PTO Nominating Chair, Band Booster Club Volunteer, PTO Staff Appreciation Co-Chair, PTO Secretary, Track Team Volunteer, Quarterback Club Grade Level Coordinator, Girls Basketball Booster Club Spirit Coordinator. At the Woodlands High School, she's in her 11th year. 
She has been the PTO president of the Woodlands High School five years. She has been the vice president of programs, PTO graduation Highlander lock-in chair for two years, PTO new family liaison, PTO nominating chair, girls basketball spirit coordinator, track team volunteer, original member of the TWH Art Trust for the past nine years, quarterback club, grade level coordinator, end of the year program coordinator, and golf tournament chair, PTO staff appreciation co-chair, Marie Hopkins Art Alliance officer, band booster volunteer. In addition to her school organizations, she has been the Texas Teacher Association Friend of Education Award recipient in the 11-12 school year, the Interfaith of the Woodlands Five Who Share Education Award in 2013. In summary, we wanted to show Carol how much we appreciate all she's done for more than 20 years for our schools. She's positively impacted hundreds of staff members and thousands of children. Carol Durkee is a blessing, and we truly could not have been as successful as we have been without her efforts. So we thank her. Awesome. Okay, so while they listed a ton of stuff that I know that most of us could not recite because it was quite lengthy, I know that that doesn't even begin to cover everything that you've done for CISD and for our students over these last 22 years. And if we could clone you in every feeder zone, on every campus, trust me, we would. To have parents like you that are so involved and that are willing to give so freely of their time, keep this district at the top of our game and we're so grateful to you but this this is a patrons influencing education award and we, we call it affectionately our pie award for a reason because it actually comes with a pie <laughs> Thank you all very much. Um, we know that this is a, a evening away from family with homework and all that is involved. So if you want to make your, your leave now, feel free. Uh, none of us will be offended in the least. So uh, item, I really want to skip this. Um, item 2E. I don't think you'll get a second on that. So. Uh, I would like to. <laughs> I'm going to take uh, the liberty of kind of moving out front here if I can. This one. <laughs> well, thanks you all for, for being here tonight and being a part of that celebration. Um, it's always special when we can celebrate the work of the children in our school district. We would not have the success that we have that you've seen here represented by these children tonight that you'll see further on tonight as we present academic information. It would not happen without great school board members. Um, and those of you that come to every meeting, you see the work that these unpaid volunteers uh, do. The amount of time that they put in answering phone calls, answering emails, going to campuses, campus visits, board meetings, um, it's truly remarkable. And we are so blessed to have great people filling those roles. And tonight is a little bittersweet because we, we don't really say goodbye, but we, we say uh, see you in a different way. Uh, she's not going to be a board member, but she'll still be a parent for us. I'm going to ask Ms. Melanie Bush if you please come join me up here.
amount of time that you put in has been remarkable. Um, we're proud of you. We congratulate you for what you'll do for the county. And we're thankful that you have that opportunity, but we're going to miss you here. I think the work that you've done um, communicating with the public, uh, you've been an advocate for parents, you've been an advocate for children, you've been an advocate for employees. And everyone has noticed that and appreciated it. I think when you we think about your tenure on this board, we're going to look back to someone that's been a champion for all students, and especially a champion for the mental health of our students. And um, that goes further than anything else that we do. So tonight, can you just say thank you and best of luck? And we're so glad that we still have your daughters in the district. And we look forward to seeing you uh, for years to come. So congratulations. <laughs>participation. Ms. Godfrey, has anyone registered to address the board? Yes. The next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of more than five must appoint one representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. Joshua Jaros. ready? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, my name is Joshua Jarris. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I think it's a great, uh, great advantage when citizens can, can be involved in the school and the government and to share things that are going on, uh, situations that we're having, problems that we're dealing with. Uh, as many of you, I'm sure you've all seen the video. Uh, it's been viewed over 85,000 times. Uh, and it's a video of me when I went to have lunch with uh, my children this uh, couple weeks ago. And uh, I'm a, I'm a divorced dad in Texas, and uh, there, is a, there is a custody agreement uh, that is in place. And uh, in that agreement, it says that I am allowed to have uh, access to the school at any time. Uh, if you look at the legislative intent of the uh, Texas Family Code, of the legislators that passed that legislation, it is clear without any doubt that parents have access to their children in school. There, there is no, there's no regulating that. So when we have an activity at school that is open to all parents, it is open to all parents. We can't start uh, relegating and say, well, this parent can get in and this parent can't. Now, there are situations, and I've looked at it, uh, there are situations if, if there's something specific in that court order that says that that parent cannot be at school events, yes, then the school can, can prevent that parent from entering the premises. Um, that was not in my court order. Um, there is also another situation where if a parent is coming for something that's a non-activity, just showing up randomly and coming. Uh, of course, I was there for a school lunch, and uh, school policy at uh, Conroe ISD encourages parents to have lunch with their children. I think that's a great thing. Um, the third thing was if a parent is being disruptive and, and, and somehow causing, uh, um, you know, being detrimental to the school's purpose of educating children. And uh, I, I asked for the school's uh, record to be preserved. The video that uh, I entered the premises, I left calmly. Um, some people have said, man, you, you held it together really good. If that would have happened to me, I don't know what I would have done. And uh, now I just wanted to inform everybody. About uh, two hours after I had left the school, their mom uh, sent a text message and said, man, you could have called me. I would have told them it was okay to go to school and have lunch with the kids. 
And uh, she's since uh, filled out a form that says I can. And I spoke to a reporter this afternoon about this incident, and uh, she said, well, the problem's fixed. But you know, the problem really isn't fixed yet. Uh, according to the Texas Family Code, we don't need another parent's permission. If you're a parent, you're not subjected to any infringement upon those rights. That is a right that you have. When the, when the Texas Family Code says you have access to school activities, we can't start picking what school activities that, that parent can or cannot go to. Um, incidentally, there's been a number of other parents who, who I've talked to at Conroe ISD um, that have had similar issues. Some of them were about school lunch. Some of them were about access to their records. Um, I had one father that came up to me uh, that said that uh, the school told him, and this was at Burnham Woods Elementary, told him that he could not go to the father-daughter dance because it was not during his possession time. I find these things deeply troubling. Uh, the superintendent called me um, the next day, and uh, the, the main, the main uh, uh, concern on her mind was had I hired an attorney. I'm not looking to litigate this. I believe this, uh, I'm standing on pretty solid ground. I want to fight for these other parents that don't, uh, maybe there's an issue there. Um, as long as there's not something in their court order, they're not causing trouble, let's let them have lunch with their kids. Um, and I, I'd encourage you to do one thing in the next couple of weeks. Take a chance, go into Burnham Woods Elementary. When you walk in, you go through the security doors, there's a stage and there's the big cafeteria where everybody sits and eats. There's a couple tables there. I think there's four tables for parents to sit at. Sit off to the side there and watch as parents sit down. You watch as those kids come out through the, through the lines and you watch how excited they are to see their parents. Having parents involved in school is important. Parents that have, our children that have both parents involved have higher test scores. There's less uh, teen, uh, teen uh, pregnancy, less teen drug use. There's a whole host of social benefits. And one of our number one safety issues happens to be school safety. CNN did a study on the, the mass shooters that we've, uh, the incidents that we had, they took, took the top 27. Out of the top 27, 26 of the mass shooters came from a fatherless home. Nine, nine out of 10 dads, uh, in, in nine out of 10 uh, uh, parents who go through divorce are dads. These children shouldn't be put in a place where they can't see their dad at school. This should be a place where we, we, we encourage family involvement. So I'd encourage you, go sit in Burnham Woods and watch as those kids come out and they see their parents and how excited they are to see them. I hope that you guys will, will take this into consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Godfrey. <coughs> Michael Clifton. Good evening, President Bush, uh, members of the Board of Trustees, Superintendent Knoll. Um, boy, I commend you. You have quite a bit of accomplishment with uh, this ISD, as we saw earlier this evening, with your students, staff, etc. So it's unfortunate that I follow that with a, kind of a blight, if you will, following Mr. Jaros. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Mr. Jaros as well to shed light on that specific problem where a parent was denied access to their child, specifically surrounding a lunchtime interaction. Um, administration taking that decision, I think, is in conflict with laws, both federal and state. Not only that conflict, but publications on your own website internal to not only Burnham Woods, but the CISD in general are in conflict not only with each other on that topic, but also in conflict with multiple laws. I share Mr. Jaros's concern in hoping that this board looks internally to address this issue and not disenfranchise any parent, whether it's a mother, whether it's a father. We want all parents, such as we saw, you had a, a wonderful turnout of parents, family members, and they still may be in here uh, behind me right now in that capacity. And to see that involvement is one thing, but to actually have that involvement in a child's life is only beneficial. So with that said, I hope that this board looks at not only your internal documents and publications, but change 
a notice, specifically one, I didn't want to provide that here in this forum, but there's one titled a notice to parents on this issue, but it's also not compliant with your own policies on a legal document under guidelines or for local or legal regulations. So I don't understand how you can provide that to a, as it happened in this case, it was provided to Mr. Jaros, but it's not a policy, it's actually titled a notice. So maybe look at the compliance of that document as well. And let's, let's bring parents more into the fold. If you're experiencing that within your ISD where you don't see student and parental involvement, here's a good opportunity to change that. So I thank you for your time and the public attendance on this issue as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Item three is a consent agenda. I have had no request to remove anything. Motion to approve consent agenda is presented. Second. All those in favor? Motion passes. Item 4A, receive 2017-18 SAT ACT advanced placement and high school completion results. Dr. Knoll. All right, Mr. Colshan will present our data tonight. President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Knoll. Uh, tonight we're going to continue to celebrate student achievement as we have earlier with the Woodlands High School feeder zone. Uh, we're going to present information on academic goals on different assessments and measures used to determine academic success. Before we get into the data, I'd like to thank the following people for helping put this report together. Uh, Dr. Hines, Dr. Phillips, Dr. Winkler, Dr. Taylor in the assessment and evaluation group, Greg Ship in CTE, Darren Carlisle, Coordinator of Bilingual and ESL, Denise Sapola, Coordinator of Guidance and Counseling, Debbie McNeely, Coordinator of Advanced Programs, Laura Willard, College Readiness Specialist, and my assistant, Sec uh, Tracy Peterson. Uh, many of them are in attendance tonight. Thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for helping put this together. They do a great job in assisting our students and our, our schools in producing these results, but the true recognition and credit really belongs at the campus level with the work the administrators, counselors, and teachers do every day that achieves these results that we're about to review. Let's start with graduation rate. Uh, we don't have data yet from 2018 as that lags a year behind. Uh, but as you can see in the class of 2017, 95.6% of our students graduate as opposed to the state's 89.7%. Uh, the class of 2018, we have some data for, um, they were the first class to graduate under the foundations plan with endorsements. Uh, under this plan, all students are required to earn 26 credits, four in each of the four core subject areas, two in languages other than English, uh, one credit in uh, PE, one credit in fine arts, and then they have five and a half elective credits that they're eligible to, uh, to serve. Um, they have five opportunities to earn endorsements, which goes on their transcript. They can earn endorsements in science and technology, engineering and math, or STEM, business and industry, public service, arts and humanities, and multidisciplinary studies. As I mentioned, we don't have the overall graduation rate yet, but I can tell you, that we graduated 3,957 students in 2018, and 94.8% of those students earned one or more endorsements. Uh, many earned multiple endorsements. We were awarded a total of 7,638 endorsements to those less than 4,000 students. So that's a great accomplishment in our first year under the endorsement plan. So you ask, what happens to those 4.4% of the students who didn't graduate? Well, here's some data from 2017, and it's remained very constant over recent years. 1% uh, receive a GED, 2% uh, return to school to complete graduation requirements and hopefully graduate the following year, and then 1% were classified as dropouts. And as I mentioned, this data remains very constant over the last three years, and we are significantly less uh, on the dropout rate than the state of Texas. Uh, so that's, that's good news for our students. The next measure is the SAT, which is an exam used by many colleges and universities as part of their admissions process. We continue to see a steady increase in the number of students taking the SAT, 
thanks to the efforts of our efforts of our guidance counselors at the campus level who encourage students to participate in this event uh, exam last year we gave 2454 SATs and as you can see it's been a steady increase over the years on SAT participation uh, as important as participation is performance the SAT is a two-part test evidence-based reading and writing and math a perfect score in either section is an 800 our evidence-based reading and writing results is a 576 that's our, our student average which is 40 points points higher than the national average and over 50 points higher than the state of Texas the second portion of the test is math and our students averaged 572 or 52 points higher than the U.S. and 60 points above the Texas average. Mr. Coach, quick question. On the previous slide, that's in real, real student number, figure that figures there. How much is that attributed to the growth of the district as opposed to percentage of kids that we have? Um, I don't in other know. Words, Back in 2008, how many kids do we have relative to how many kids we have now? Oh, oh certainly. We've grown Correct. around so roughly 1,500 so students per year, not not all of them seniors. Understood. So my, my, I would like to see this also as a percentage of the kids that we have. How many are taking the SAT okay. as a percentage of the kids? We can, we can certainly get that for you. It's a little bit more representative. Yes, sir. Well, if you look at 2308 to 2454, if we've been averaging... 1,000, 1,500 kids a year across the district. Yeah, it's, it's likely a, it's likely a, a hundred or so, yeah. 90 to 100 seniors probably Correct. somewhere in there, additional mm -hmm. throughout. So the, I think so that's, that's the percentage awesome. is going up as well as the yeah. total number is going up. What was that, Ms. Miller? These are seniors, so this is for the 20, 2018 high school <clears throat> graduates, so they're they only counted in grade 12, and this is a, if a student took the SAT more than once, they use the most recent score as a summary. So this should be accurate data as far as a head count for us. For last year. No, that's not the thing. No, I know, I know. Yeah, but I mean, we grew 150, you know, yes, well, that's more than the students we grew. 80 right. seniors yeah. would be like yeah, more most likely. Nice. I, bet it's, I bet it's both. It'd be nice to know, though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can get that. <clears throat> uh, the SAT combines the two tests into a composite score. And again, uh, as compared to the nation, we, we fare very well. And to the state, our composite score is 1,148, almost 100 points above the national and 116 points above the state average. Uh, trends on, on the SAT, this is uh, since 2006-7. You can see that our scores uh, are very steady and have continued to rise. Now, the, the test was redesigned in 2016 and 17 to the evidence-based reading and writing. Uh, in math portion, so you see both, uh, all three, uh, our averages, the state and nation, national averages went up. But I want to point out that at, at the same time, we saw a five, per, a five point gain from 2017 to 2018. Uh, nationally, there was a, a pretty significant decline in scores mm -hmm. at the same time. And in a lot of these standardized tests, our, t our scores are higher than the state and the nation, but we mirror growth about the same rate. Uh, but this was a, an opportunity where we actually exceeded where, where the na uh, national scores declined. Can I ask a peripheral question? Sure. This this next year, they're, for the LSAT, they're phasing out writing and it's going digital. And so I was wondering if y'all have heard, is the SAT going in that direction as well? There's an optional writing portion to the SAT. No, not the... Uh, oh, there's not a written, not a paper, oh, okay. paper yeah. version. Yeah, all yeah it's all going to be computer-based. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. So was, yeah, not, at that, not at this time. Okay. I'm just curious. It's, that's the trend with the... Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it'll be going to be here. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, we, tonight we honored our National Merit semifinalists, and again, not to repeat all that, but, uh, you know, to become a National Merit semifinalist in Texas it is one of the top ten, one, ten toughest states to be declared a National Merit semifinalist. Our scores, our, our, our state is very competitive, and to rank in the top 1% is a true achievement for our students. Um, and you can see that we were increased 16. Uh, from 2018 uh, 18 to this year's class of 40 in 2019. 
And again, about 90% of them will become finalists in February. The other uh, test used by colleges and universities for acceptance, part of the acceptance process is the ACT. Um, as you can see, our, our rate of participation continues to increase. Um, this is not as popular a test amongst seniors in Texas and in CISD as the SAT is. Uh, the SAT is kind of the, the standard in the state of Texas for sure. But a lot of our students will take the ACT in addition to the SAT. Um, differences in the test, um, ACT is divided into four sections, English, math, reading, and science. And each uh, section is graded on a scale score of 1 to 36, with 36 being high. And as you can see, in each one of these subject areas, our students perform very well as compared to their counterparts in the state and nation. Our English uh, average is two points higher than the national average, math 2.6, reading 2.5, and science 2.4. And the composite, as well as you can see, is significantly higher than both state and national averages. This is a uh, ACT composite trend. Uh, since 2008, and you can see the regression line, uh, and it shows a steady growth and, and anticipated growth in the future uh, of positive results. I have to read that. Okay, I got to yeah. the regression analysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are dropping off of that. Okay. Uh, another part of the ACT is the college readiness trend, mm -hmm. and what they do is they establish a, uh, a standard for each one, a, a mean score. So in English, the, the cut, uh, standard is an 18, math a 22, social studies a 22, and science a 23. So students scoring at those levels, uh, ACT predicts they have a 75% chance of making a C or higher during their first semester of college in the corresponding course. So they think it's a, a pretty clear predictor of success in college. Uh, in English, 74% 74, 74 of our students scored at that rate or above. Math, 58%, social studies, 62%, and science, 43%. And overall, 42% of, of our students achieved the mean in all four areas. So we're very pleased with those results. Uh, advanced placement, this is one uh, opportunity students have to earn college credits in high school. Uh, their test, these tests are administered in May each year and uh, they're scored on a one to five scale. College Board offers more than 30 courses to high school students and an opportunity to earn credit. Generally, a score of three or higher will earn a student credit uh, as awarded by Texas public universities. Uh, as you can see by the chart, our, our numbers of students participating in the advanced placement program continues to increase, as do the number of uh, tests that we administer. So as you can see, last year, 4,812 students took one or more AP exams. We gave 99, almost 10,000 exams. So <laughs> students are taking multiple AP exams during their high school experience. Our, student, our schools continue to challenge our students to take tough coursework to prepare them for the next level. <clears throat> the AP mean score uh, in CISD is a 2.99, and that's up from 2.89 <coughs> a year ago. Um, when you can see growth both in score and in participation, that's a positive sign. Uh, and we're real proud of that. And you, as you can see, we far outperform both the state and the nation in those uh, areas. The top AP exams taken, uh, probably the, the well, 53%, 45% of the uh, all AP exams are social studies related exams. Um, followed by science, 19%, math, 13%, English, 11%. Uh, it's interesting to note that the two most popular exams, world history and AP human geography, world history is a sophomore level course, mm -hmm. and AP, uh, AP human is a freshman level course. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're attracting those students at the freshman and sophomore level and, and building that culture, and they continue to take exams as they grow through their high school experience. Uh, we also have a growing program in our, our dual credit. We have a partnership with Lone Star College that gives students another opportunity to earn college credit while still in high school. Um, what's really impressive is you see growth in, growth in the AP program 
and you also see growth in the dual credit program. Uh, there have been cases in other districts where the emphasis on dual credit has really uh, diminished the, the role of AP. Both of those programs on our campuses are growing. Uh, you know, it's a great opportunity in each avenue, uh, and, and a lot of students will take a combination of AP and dual credit courses through their high school career. Um, in the last five years, we've increased the number of students participating in dual credit by 1,800. So that's a very impressive growth. Uh, the next slide shows you the, most po the, the courses that we teach at the campus level for dual credit. Obviously, English is the most popular, uh, followed by history, math, and then uh, uh, Spanish. So in, in the 2017-18 year, we had a total, when you combine both semesters, 3,000. 917 students taking dual credit courses. We also have a partnership with Lone Star College and workforce programs, and these are courses that are taught at Lone Star uh, Conroe campus. Uh, Computer numeric controls operation programming, we have seven students enrolled. Uh, the EMT program, emergency medical technician, is really booming. Our students are performing very well. Uh, we have over half of the slots, and it comes. They, they serve multiple school districts, and we have over half of the slots dedicated to CISD students. And the word we get from uh, the Lone Star College people is that our students are far outperforming the other students from other districts. Uh, as you know, um, we have a lot of students who earn industry-based certifications. Last year, we awarded 3,643 3, certifications, and that's up from the 2,190 in 2017. And it will only grow. As you heard in the accountability report uh, earlier in the year, that, that certifications are now an important part of the accountability system for our schools. So we continue to push students to get involved and achieve one or more certifications during their high school experience. Our two most popular certifications earned by our students are Child Care Education Institute. We had 904 students last year earn that certification. And then the Serve Safe Food Handlers was 743. And those are both certifications that students can use immediately in finding either full-time or part-time employment. So what do our kids do after high school? Uh, over 50% of them go to a four-year college, and this is based on uh, surveys that the campuses do at the end of the senior year. Uh, almost 30% of them uh, will attend, indicate they will attend a two-year college, and then the next largest is about 14% say they will plan to work full-time, and uh, a smaller percentage go to a, vo a vocational technical school, and others join the military. So that's kind of where our kids indicate they're heading following high school. Uh, here's a list of the uh, most popular four-year universities that our students are attending. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, the Aggies lead the way. Thank you. Uh, and then Sam Houston State and University of Texas at Austin are, are close behind. Uh, we see a lot more students going to the University of Houston than we have in the past. Go Cougs. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're just saying that for someone in particular. Well, right. <laughs> I had to change the color on the graph. Uh, school colors right this so, morning. Hey, man. Uh, yeah, our kids go, are going off to college and, be, and being very successful when they do it. we got some Bearcat pride up here, too. There you There's go. Some, All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Colshan. Um, item 4B, Receive Texas Accountability Summary and Tell Pass Results for 2017-18. Dr. Knoll. All right, Dr. Hines. Thank you very much. President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Knoll. I want to, this evening we're going to provide just a quick update of our uh, Tell Pass and Accountability from this past year that was released. also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Edith Upshaw is here, and uh, she's, and also Miss Darren Carlisle is here. She's our bilingual coordinator, and so wanted to acknowledge their help in putting together tonight's report. Um, first, we'll we'll touch base about TELPASS. That's the Texas English Language Proficiency Assessment System. It's part of the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act accountability system for our English learners. Uh, states must show annual increase in the progress that our English language our English learners make in, I have to get used to that, it used to be ELL, now it's EL, 
um, in learning English and attaining proficiency. There's four language domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and there's four proficiency levels, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and advanced high. And just a little bit of the, some of the features, uh, beginning is little or no English, uh, intermediate is limited ability and simple language structures, advanced is more grade appropriate with support, and then advanced high is grade appropriate with minimal support. In uh, the spring of 2018, they, they changed the way they scored these tests. Uh, so um, these domains will not be considered for the accountability purposes for this 18, 19 year only. Um, and as a result, it really makes it difficult. We can't compare to last year. So I don't have a comparison to say, how do we do compared to last year? Because we really have a different scoring system. So uh, with that, we wanted to show you how we did um, on the uh, spring of 2018. And this is just kind of a quick summary. Uh, you know, one, one of the things we do note is that uh, we are um, in a continuously receiving students that are acquiring English. So that it's not just something where a student shows up in pre-K. We have students that enroll all, at all grade levels um, grade. throughout. So that's why you might see a student entering in uh, ninth grade at the beginning of level. Uh, a student might arrive here and well, start high school. Twelfth grade. Or twelfth I mean. grade. Yeah. So these are just the results. And I'm going to switch gears to the state accountability system, as you're aware. And I know you've, you've received training on this, that uh, the system converted to one for the districts received a letter grade this year. And so we have um, received our um, results. There's three domains or three parts. Domain one is student achievement. Domain two, school progress, uh, and or uh, comparison to other like uh, districts and then domain three is closing the achievement gaps and this is just a quick summary of how we did overall and uh, we did well as always we want to continue to work on um, getting better we want to continuously improve uh, dr. Hines on this the component score we would have gotten an A correct and then they scaled it down because of our Correct. Our so, campus. in um, and you'll see that in domains one and uh, three or one and three, we would get scaled to an 89. So when you have a when you have a school that's in improvement required, the most you can receive is an 89. And and, and as we discussed when we looked at their plan, they might not would have been still under that had the standards not continually changed. Okay, just continuing to put that on the record. Mm -hmm. Uh, domain one is student achievement, as I mentioned. That just provides an overview of how students scored on uh, achievements across all the subjects for all students. And for el elementary and middle schools, it's star scores only. For the high schools, it's not just star scores. They also have a component called, called college, career, military readiness, and then they include graduation rates. So those are weighted components for the high schools. And as uh, Mr. Colson shared, we do very well in the graduation rate. Um, and we're, we're looking at in dual credit and AP and those are other ways that we get those points. So um, we're continuing to work on that. In domain one, we, we had a, a scale score of 89. The state had a scale score of 76, just to give a perspective of how we did. Dr. Hines? Yes. Go back to one slide. We, we oftentimes compare ourselves to our peer group in our community, in our area. Do you know about where our peer group is? And I, I do not have all of that tonight, but we can get you that information. We do have a, we have a couple of slides where we do some comparisons with some peer groups, but uh, not on this one. Okay, we can get that. Uh, part two is student progress, uh, and this is a two-part. So domain two has two parts. One is academic growth, which is credited for students who perf improve performance year over year, as measured by the star. And it's, and it's captured in reading and mathematics for those available grade levels. There's also a Part B, which is relative performance, when uh, credit is awarded based on performance relative to similar districts. And in this particular domain, a, a district will receive the score the better of A or B. So whichever one you do better in, you would get that score. Uh, I think we did better in Part B, so that would be our score. In Part, uh, part A, uh, we had an 85 compared to the state 79 and then in uh, part b we had a scale score of 88 <clears throat> and you can see we, if we go up a little bit and we and we can do that um, we will be in the a range so we want to continue to work on 
that. And this is scaled based on not just how we did, but also related to districts based on the percentage of students that are economically disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And then domain three is performing the closing uh, closing performance gaps, and this is really uh, the, the old uh, NCLB requirements, but now it's the ESSA compliance. And so this is based on weighted performance, and this actually uses for uh, graduation rates the federal definition, so it's just tweaked a little bit different, but very similar. Um, so one point for each student at or above the approach is grade level standard and two points for students that are at the master's grade level. And it's also calculated by subjects and by student groups. Uh, we had a, um, this is a slide that does give you a comparison of how we did with some like districts. And we do, uh, we do very well. Uh, and last year we had 74 of the 86 targets that were met for 86%. And this year we had 93% of our targets were met. Uh, so that's 85 out of 91. In the old days, we called those safeguards, but they're targets now. Um, and you can see we did quite well. Dr. Hines, can you go back one slide? Or um, I know on the lowest performing race, race and ethnicity, I know one year one of our groups was, I think, Pacific Islander or something along those lines, and not even every campus had, a, had group. A, mm -hmm. a representative student of that ethnicity group. Are we still seeing that happen, or did this year that change? I'm just, that's that's so hard for campuses to meet that when that changes every year. It is, it's based on, it, it is, it's based on, it's going to vary from year to year. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, one of the targets for, for this particular domain is really going after each and every single student. Which, and, which and we do, I yes. know, as a district, no matter what. But I just know that when you're being measured specifically on two, two specific ethnicity groups, and if your campus yeah. doesn't even have a, a student that's in that ethnicity so. group, that, that is a, a challenge to meet that standard. I do yeah. have that, but I'll have to look it up. Okay. Wait a minute. It's in, a, it's in this big pile of stuff. So. <laughs> you're right. I, I don't just, know it off the top I of just, my head. But, I, I know but that that's a challenge for campus is faced. But I don't know what will be for next for year. For next year. Okay. He'll bring to the We're next so year. Well, you uh, <laughs> I actually have a band concert that night, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Chris doesn't know the answer. I have it in here. I'll have to look it up. We're throwing him for some right loops tonight. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, and Tamika is out of town at a yeah. training conference, and Dr. Uh, Taylor would know the answer. Oh, right I'm here, sure. So she would know it off the top, would know of, her it off the top of her head. I have to look it up. Uh, and I may have looked it up earlier and already forgot. So, um, so possible uh, uh, something else that I'll just mention that's part of the accountability is campuses can earn distinctions, designations, and it varies on the campus level. Uh, but they can get distinctions for top 25% in student progress, for top 25% of closing achievement gaps, uh, for post-secondary readiness, and for uh, academic performance for reading, English language arts, math, social studies, and science. Uh, and they're, they're grouped by similar campuses based on uh, demographics, and, and if they score in the top 25%. Elementary and intermediate schools in the top quartile on at least 50% of the eligible measures are qualified to receive the distinction and for high schools in the top quartile on at least 33% of the eligible measures are qualified. And so this year, uh, this past year, 38% of the uh, available distinctions were earned. And just to give you a comparison of how we did to like districts, um, we did we did pretty well. Um, and, you know, we have schools that missed it just by, but so does everybody, and so we want to keep working oh, on yeah. that, how we can get better and get more distinctions. Definitely the uh, shining star of the county. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Thank you. Item 4C, consider approval of the 2018-2019 campus improvement plans, and I'll actually go ahead and lump D in here. I know we'll have to do the district improvement plan as well. And we'll start with the campus improvement plans. So I'll ask our assistant superintendents, Dr. Phillips, Mr. Colshan, to present that. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Null. We're here tonight to present the campus improvement plans that were developed on each campus. As you know, these plans are developed annually by the principal with the support of their site-based team. 
These plans directly align with the district improvement plan in order to work together to achieve our goals. The campus improvement planning process begins with a needs assessment. The principal and the team analyze data to determine needs. Data, of course, includes star scores, but it also includes other data such as BAS reading scores, graduation rates, parent and student input, etc. Once needs are determined, the campus determines goals and strategies to meet these goals using the district improvement plan as a guide. The areas that are addressed by each of our plans include student achievement and post-secondary success, recruitment, development, and retention of staff, parents and community engagement, school safety, and technology. And we know you've had the opportunity to look at these already, so unless you have questions, we are now asking for your approval of these plans. I move the approval. Got a motion? <laughs> All right. Any questions? Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All right. Motion passes, and D is the district improvement plan. Dr. Hines. So if I just looked at the district improvement plan that I was about to touch base, I would have answered your question because it's right there. <laughs> Growth and reading Pacific Islander is targeted. And then um, and then in graduation rate, uh, our African-American economically disadvantaged English learner and special education populations are targeted okay. based on the uh, you, closing the gap report. Um, and to follow up on the campus, um, Improvement plan, the district improvement plan tonight. Um, we are here to ask for your uh, approval of the district improvement plan. State law requires that all districts have a district improvement plan that is developed, evaluated, and revised annually by the superintendent with the assistance of the district level planning and decision making committee. And that committee actually meets the, the day following each of our board meetings. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this plan is to guide our district and campus staff in the improvement of student performance for all student groups in order to attain state standards in respect to the Texas Accountability System indicators. And the plan must include a lot of things, including a comprehensive needs assessment addressing district student performance on the Texas Education Agency Accountability Summary, measurable district performance objectives for all appropriate academic excellence indicators for all student populations, strategies for improvement of student performance, and that includes uh, looking at instructional methods, dropout reduction, discipline management, uh, staff development, career education, and accelerated education. Strategies for providing uh, our junior high and high school students with information about higher education admissions and sources of information on higher education admissions and financial aid, resources needed to implement strategies, staff responsible, timelines, formative evaluation criteria, and the policy addressing sexual abuse and maltreatment of students. So all these things are in that plan. Uh, it is, um, again, as mentioned by Dr. Phillips, organized around those six goals that she listed. And tonight we ask for your approval. And, and please keep in mind that it is a work in progress. So. Uh, we're always looking at it and making tweaks and revisions. I move we approve as presented. Second. All right. Any questions? No. All those in favor? Thank you, Dr. Hines. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 5A, receipt 2019-2020 calendar information. Dr. Knoll. We are working, Dr. Hines, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We're going to... Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the 1920 school calendar process. As we mentioned, um, that is something that the district level planning committee works on to, to bring to you as a recommendation. And uh, in October, we actually at our last meeting started uh, to talk about the calendar and looking at possibilities. And I know it's early. It just seemed like we just started school, but we start looking at it because it is a multi-month process. Uh, tonight, I'm here asking in if you have any feedback that you would like to give me and I can take that back to our committee to begin working on this. Um, we will meet uh, begin tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we're already started looking at the, you know, just some templates and I'll show you a template here in a minute. Um, we will hopefully develop some draft calendars and then hopefully get those up uh, at, at this end of this week or if not right when we get back from Thanksgiving and leave up for a few weeks. Um, during that time, we would take feedback on those drafts, and then our hope uh, we will come back together in January to meet 
and we will um, look at the feedback and hopefully come back to you on January the 15th with a recommendation uh, for a calendar and that is basic timeline obviously if something gets delayed we would come back in February but, but right now our target is January some things that we know um, our district innovation status allows us to begin the school year prior to what would be August the 26th in 2019 would be the first day of school otherwise and so we've been able to start earlier uh, the teacher work schedule is 187 days so whatever our calendar is there's 187 days that our teachers work uh, our students aren't under a requirement for numbers of days they're under requirement for minutes and that changed a couple of years ago so uh, they have to go to school 75,600 minutes the last two years since we've been doing this we've actually included enough minutes to have two inclement weather days in fact we used those last year I believe and so we did not have to make up any student days um, because we had those minutes built into our calendar which would My be a total wanted one this today this morning we almost it's took it we almost took it we have, I mean oh, we paid for it so might as well take it right um, so there are 76,440 minutes that we would need if we wanted to do that again to build that into the calendar uh, our, currently our school day is uh, 430 minutes uh, the high schools go 435 and 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 that's because they do some other things with uh, early release on some additional exams mm -hmm. and some other adjustments uh, currently we have uh, four early release days placed at the end of each nine weeks one at the end of each nine weeks grading period and we also have a waiver that allows us to count those minutes for the entire day so because we have a waiver even though we only go to school half a day we get to count the whole day minutes we also have a staff development waiver that allows us to count the minutes for up to three days of staff development so um, we have that many minutes allowed for a waiver things we've also learned that our calendar greatly affects family schedules and it and it really drives a lot of the calendars in the county uh, mm -hmm. so many schools uh, you know private schools or uh, daycares look at our calendar we've had very positive feedback on starting midweek so that's been something that's been popular so uh, when we start on that Monday it's it's rough right out of the gate to go five days but but starting midweek has been real popular uh, the other thing that's been popular is being able to finish in May mm. so that's specifically been... before the holiday I keep hearing yeah <laughs> I don't know about that <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's next to impossible to happen yeah, but they keep requesting yeah no it's yeah it, it could be done when we can go we can go to 5 30 at night I think we can get it done um, Dr. Hines on, on the two things that you just touched on starting in the middle of the week and then finishing in May are, do our other districts around here do they give are they asking how you're doing those I, I've, I've actually been approached by other folks in San Antonio and stuff asking how are we able to do this stuff and what the reaction is do you have people contacting y'all asking what reaction that the school gets and the community gets and things of that nature because I it has I haven't heard anybody really complain about that at all they love the, the first one was the getting getting used to that new schedule but since then like you've said starting in the middle of the week seems like that was a real hit and then the May ending in May is great are, are there other districts contacting y'all to ask you, you know, we do we do get some uh, we do talk to other districts and we share a little bit of what are you thinking here's what we're looking at um, it's you know it's kind of interesting different um, things rise up in different communities is what's important to them and and they you know uh, I did we saw an early version of HISD's release their calendar uh, usually they don't start coming out till January February uh, so we don't get a chance to see what they formally adopt um, there was a process a few years ago with region 4 where they actually were sharing they had a, a, a committee and so we could get insight we're not in region 4 but we were able to get their information and see what they were looking at and it helps us look at spring breaks and those kind of things but uh, we do get that question and they can start earlier if they do the innovation district of innovation and some districts haven't done that so they always say how did you do that well we did the district yeah, of innovation basically referring to is that district of innovation yeah. I mean I would assume the applications for that have got to they've been going up well, uh, yeah I think they've been going up I think you're seeing more and more districts that are seeing that as the, an option and mm -hmm. the minutes are really interesting because um, you know it's a it's a it's a tough one it, it's um, well, you know we get feedback both ways we get feedback that hey you know these extra minutes are too much we weren't you're making the day longer or 
Um, people like it, so some people like it. Right. Well, in some districts, correct me if I'm wrong, but with the minutes, we build in those two mm -hmm. inclement mm -hmm. weather days. Some districts I know don't, and even some in our county, and then they get into trouble and have to add on days yep. when they have issues. And, and so while they look like they have a smaller calendar than us, if something happens, which lately, inevitably, something happens, um, they're in trouble. You can, and, that, and that is true. And if you, that's the advantage of building them in. The other option the state was trying to give you is that, you know, you could actually stack a bunch of minutes if you wanted to make it up rather than add another day. The problem is if you get something that happens late the spring, like we yeah. had the Memorial Day flood, right. and you know, it, it, it that's a, it's late, and you'd have to add a lot of minutes to make up 430 minutes in one month, and so. Uh, really, that would have been a week. <laughs> we would have been going. Yeah. It, would have, it was a day. It would have been a day. So, right. um, you know, it's there's give and takes. Um, but certainly, what we've done the last two years, I think, is, I think people mm -hmm. generally like, and uh, and that's kind of where we start with when we when we begin mm -hmm. looking at calendars. Is what are we doing currently, and then trying to build from there. There was a change in the staff development rules last year. That was a difference from two years ago. So that was a little bit more restrictive on the minutes. So we used to be able to count the first day of school as a staff development day, uh, and we lost that. So uh, we, unless that day happens after school starts, you don't get to count those minutes in your total. Well, we're not bumping them to Saturdays anymore, though, right? No. Now, you know, it's, it's always an option, but, but we, we don't. The last two years we haven't for mm -hmm. sure, though. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, and we can look at that. We, we always have some flexibility with how we make up the time for our staff mm -hmm. um, because we do have that ability to work. And so we've been <coughs> flexible with how we make it up with, with the staff days. And I always have to remind everybody of that. The students are under the minutes. Our staff is still under the regular days. rules. Right. Yeah. Um, All right. Um, we've, also, um, we've also found that you know, we have them, we build them in, but those short weeks are challenges for us in terms of student attendance. Um, so that's just a reality that we look at. Uh, we, we try not to do a week less than three days. We only have a two-day week. It's not likely we're going to have great attendance. Uh, we do get feedback that people like the whole week off for Thanksgiving. So that's been popular. We've been doing that several years now. Uh, we also hear that people like when we string together three consecutive weekends for the winter break. And when I show you the template, I don't have a winter break highlighted. Um, and then the other one that we have learned is that December 28th tends to be a common possession change date in divorce decrees. Um, and then spring break, which I didn't highlight on a template right now, it's looking like it's that March 17th uh, week. But we, we historically try to coincide with Texas and A&M. So we haven't, they don't release theirs for a little while. <laughs> Uh, always comes up balancing semesters is an issue and we've done it two ways we used to if you remember several years ago we actually ended our first semester the second week in January and uh, we had a lot of feedback after doing that about five years people didn't like it and so we moved back and then we had these 15 days imbalances and people didn't like that especially if you teach a one semester course at the high school by being able to start early we've been able to keep that around 10 days difference which tends to be pretty manageable uh, and that's kind of where we get a tipping point is around that 10, 10 days. Uh, student holidays, traditionally we, we, we take, uh, we highlighted them on the template. Um, so uh, one thing I will note is the last couple of years, because of our um, being able to start early, we've been able to take an October holiday, and that's been very popular. Very. So um, that's another advantage to, uh, to that calendar. Uh, so this is just a side-by-side -side the template with what we do this year. And you can see we started on August the 15th. That same day would be August the 14th in 2019. And I just kind of, we kind of blocked out some of those those regular holidays that we take. Um, those are student holidays. And then we would fill in a spring break and a winter break. A Thanksgiving break would be that week of the 25th. Um, this, this year, um, we're able to have a, a, a long weekend in April with four days. And then next year, it looks like we have the, the star riding test on that Tuesday after. So Ooh. we we didn't no. we didn't make that a holiday on the template. So um, because we really didn't want to look at that as a holiday. Um, so we will um, our committee again will begin tomorrow. And if you have any 
Uh, one of the things I was going to mention is about, um, I'm going to go back, uh, it's not on this one, but somewhere I made a note about elections. Um, you know, we've had more feedback over time about election days, and um, it's something we've certainly looked at. Now, we know November of 2020, which is two years from now, will be a big election, and that's something that I know our committee actually already talked about a little bit in terms of planning ahead. Uh, for next year, the 1920 calendar, I, my guess is the big election would be the March primary, uh, which would yes. be March the 3rd. Mm -hmm. And yes. so, you know, that's certainly something we can look at, we, we haven't discussed. Um, but we've had, based on this last year, we have 25 schools that, that served as uh, voting sites. And so um, there was some feedback, you know, people would just get nervous about folks being on there yeah I, I wanted to bring up that election and I would ask that you take that back to district level planning as as an official concern from the board I've had a lot of feedback the last two weeks about that um, people saying they want to keep their kids out of school and they're all couching it around a security concern mm -hmm. um, and the question does arise when we have car rider lines that are outside the hundred foot boundary for polling and we have parents getting approached in the car rider line is that an elections official enforcement? Is that a our police department enforcement? I mean, we, so if we could look at the possibility if the calendar would allow us to have that as a student holiday, a staff development day, something. Um, I know there are already some online petitions circulating about it, and I think if we don't address that, that we're going to have some attendance issues, and it's never good when we have parents that are intentionally and forcibly holding their kids out for attendance reasons on those days and obviously being a tuesday i know that's a challenge right for the yeah, district that's and that's the and that's the trade-off right. you know that you will get we'll hear from folks that say you know what am i supposed to do with my child on yeah. to a random tuesday holiday in the in the middle of march and <laughs> so we'll you know we'll just have to be ready to respond to that but but having looked at that for next year that was my observation was that March day would be a much busier day at the polls than the November day when there I don't think there's any statewide offices on the November ballot but the there's presidential year. which has much higher turnout locally traditionally than state that's in 220 I think. In, in in 2020 yes in 2020 we that would yes, be our holiday in, in 2020 November. but I was talking November about next 19. year in 19. Yeah, 19 November 19 isn't right yeah. I mean that's Next it's that March 20th. So, I saw saying the March, March 3rd. It's and, March 3rd is the and then primary date. This is, is just honestly, I'm just curious, it's based around security reasons? People are feeling threatened? Oh, yeah. There were, yeah, there were allegations of some very aggressive polling that was with was outside the 100 foot boundary, but was within our car rider lines, like people knocking on car door windows with little kids in the car, handing out polling information and things like that. So. Um, and there were some parents that I understand that went ahead and just went on through the line and didn't even drop their kids off. And then some of the, the emails and calls I've gotten the last couple of weeks that the, if we don't do something else to to protect the students on those days, then they'll go ahead and keep them out the day. It's much easier at a campus like Conroe High School where the polling place is in an outbuilding in a separated parking lot and they're not in the main. Then it's on something... an elementary campus where they're exactly. right there ne mm -hmm. near the kids. The foyer. Right. And, and I think, you know, like one of our intermediates used to have it in the hallway that was fairly contained, but now because of how big that voting box has gotten, they have it in the library and have more. So they're actually having to walk through the campus to get to the library and the LC that's in the way or has to go around in order. So it's, it's causing our campuses to make quite a bit of accommodations. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if we would have, and I'm going to say this more of our churches that would open their doors on those elections days and that the county would contract with them and use those facilities rather than our schools. I guess on the flip side though, now, I hear what y'all's concern is, is if you could coordinate doing some sort of restrictions because on the flip side, it's somewhat um, inspiring or encouraging for our yes. students to see voter participation, you know, and so maybe there's a compromise or some extra resources that can be utilized well, and i will stress we do bring yeah. out our, our police do a great yes. job of yeah. covering all the polling sites we we also let the campuses bring on extra staff that day uh to help monitor the traffic in and out 
Um, and, you know, as far as enforcing the, the poll folks, it does fall on those election, uh, that election judge to enforce that, but we do report it and say, hey, we're having trouble out there. Um, and all of our campuses have a plan for polling day, a, a safety plan that they go through and kind of a, a list of consideration, but you're correct. The, the sizes of the schools vary, the, the locations vary, their ability to accommodate traffic, their ability to accommodate parking. Yeah. There's a wide range and a continuum of, of the challenges that they face. Um, and so we, we do try to work and support, but I do think they, we feel good that they all have safety plans in place, um, but it is a, uh, it's just a level of concern. And we understand that. It's a lot of people showing up. We work so hard to, to limit who gets access. <laughs> and then on election day, the doors open and everybody comes. And, yeah. um, and, it, and it is a little bit of a contrast and it's something that we're very aware of. And, and because of that, I, I, we, we do hear your concerns and we certainly, and that's something I'll take back. I mean, if that's something we want us to look at, we can, we can look at that. Is there anything else you would like us to look at? We'll look at that. No? Just keep them as long as you can. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, Spoken as a dad over there. The easiest way to accommodate the elections would Don't be... Don't send them home early. <laughs> would be to have spring break that week. And, and I know that might not coincide with the the colleges that you're discussing, but if you have spring break that first week of March when the primary is, you don't have kids on campus anyway. It is. Early in no, I, I it agree. Is, is it the first, second Tuesday in March? It's, it's, I think it's March 3rd. I was looking online today. I thought that's what it yeah, said for the Texas. first Tuesday 3rd. in March. I, I see the, the first week. parents and the folks been on campus more of an annoyance and a security issue. I mean, somebody has issues of ill will and they know it's a million adults is going to be in the facility. I don't see where that's going to be a situation where the kids are in danger, just in annoyance with the parent. As well as the traffic annoyance as well. And something like you said, the posters knocking on one door and so forth. But a security risk, I don't, I don't necessarily see that to be too prevalent. And especially when you know you're going to have the adults on site and you got extra staff and you got the police on staff. So. My concern is, like you pointed out, it's, it's the middle of the week. It's a Tuesday. Yeah. And it's not every school district. And yeah. It would seem like it would be a pretty big burden on parents and teachers. That's what I'm saying. If well, you made it spring break, that would be, in my in my mind, that would be the most logical way. If you were going to try and have the school closed on Election Day, that would be the way to do it. But it's early. Yeah. 14, so. 14 and 27 employees won't show up work that day. I didn't hear you, John. What was that? I said 14 out of 27 of my employees won't show up to work that day. Oh. You know. I'm, right. I'm no, no, no. Yeah. Right. Like just if me. we close the school, a, yeah. Right. If, every time we close the school, it has a massive trickle down effect. We know that. We look at that with inclement weather days, and that's, you know, the hardest decision. And that, that it is a Noel safety balance as well. You know, there's the. The safety concern in the building, but then there's also the safety we turn 63,000 students, Loose. many of which may not be supervised that day at home, which is its own level of safety concern. Sure, exactly. Uh, and, well. and, and it is really, a tough one. And it falls on a Tuesday, as was pointed out. A Tuesday means I'm, I'm Monday saying, bad, it'll have be bad attendance. Right, I'm not right. saying it's feasible. I'm merely raising yeah. the issue on behalf of the constituents. And we've heard oh, it. Right. So. We did, we did have some public <laughs> comments come in through this as well. And we, we do. We've, we've heard that. Conversation. And, and I will say, for, I want to stress for sure November of 20, we've got that on our radar. And so yeah. I want you to know that. I think next year's a little little more difficult to solve for but we definitely have november of 20 out there any other questions or feedback that may be the reason some of them voters are picking up their kid anyway <laughs> <laughs> we might be helping voting turnout thank you thank you dr hines item 5b receive capital improvements update All right, mr foster President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Knoll, it's my pleasure to bring you up to speed on the capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. And I'm going to start you with Suchmont Elementary. And if you've been outside recently, you've seen a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but our crews are working diligently between rain showers yeah. to get as much work done as they can. And you'll see that as a theme kind of throughout our update this month. 
working in between those drops, huh? Indeed. Uh, so, but the work at Suchma has been has continued on. We've been able to get some uh, slab pours, some elevated concrete pours done. As you can see, the structure is underway uh, on the inside of that building. The building systems are coming together as well. So you've seen the fireproofing material start going on the structure. You've seen some duct works and duct straps, some conduits and things of that nature going in. So they're making use of every time, every chance to work that they can. They report they're still uh, on schedule. So we're scheduled to open in August of uh, 19. So this coming school year, we'll be ready for our students coming in. Uh, moving on to Austin Elementary, where we're doing a building addition that helps us remove some of the older parts of that building that reached the end of their life. Um, so you can see here the structure here. This is much in the same shape as uh, such elementary here. The building slab is complete. The building structure is going up. You can see the gym on the left and uh, uh, classrooms and administration to the right. That, pro that project is moving forward very well. And just like such you're seeing the building systems coming on the inside. Here we've got fireproofing, masonry, and the plumbing and things of that nature are going in. So that school will also be ready for students in August of 19 when they come back after the summer break. Uh, so that project is on schedule as well. At Irons Junior High, where we're doing a classroom addition, uh, the exterior of that building is essentially done. You can see here, uh, over the next few weeks, as the sun begins to shine on us, uh, we're going to work on the on the yard to make the landscape and everything else uh, look like the rest of that campus. On the inside... We're counting on you to deliver the sun. <laughs> uh, my rain dances have stopped officially, just so you're aware. <laughs> Now, the inside of that building, you can see these are rolls of carpets that are staged to go down. So we just recently turned the air conditioning on inside the new portion of that building. So that building is ready for carpets, ready for all the finishes that make them classrooms. Uh, over the break, all that stuff will be installed. And after the Thanksgiving break, we'll receive the furniture for that building. And the technology moves in, and then it'll be ready for students when they return from the winter break. Stockton Junior High School. Uh, this, uh, as you can see, since uh, over the last couple months, we've received building structure. So that building is going up. The building slab is going in. Uh, parking lots are going on. So it is on schedule. It is scheduled to open in August of 2020. At Conroe High School, we're doing a building addition, which allows us to do a renovation of the main campus. So that building addition is nearing its completion as well. It turns over for student use uh, right after the winter break. So you can see from the photos on the inside, uh, it is becoming very finished on the inside. So it's it's really a uh, beautiful building. No, uh, it I, is I, a beautiful. Building. I wish I could take credit for how it looks, but that's uh, uh, some uh, real smart architects and people with pretty pencils and markers and stuff that make things look pretty. <laughs> uh, but the contractors also done a fantastic job putting that building together uh, to meet meet the uh, aesthetic requirements. So on the inside of the building is is coming along nicely. So it's running through the final inspections with the jurisdictions uh, over the next several weeks. It receives its furniture in the first week of December. Then we're working with our technology department to get it outfitted with technology for classrooms so it'll be suitable for use for our students when they return from the winter break. Beautiful. That's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Nice. Item 6A, receive financial reports. All right, Mr. Rice. All right, good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to present the financial statements for the district for the month of October. These financial statements will include our general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The first statement we'll look at this evening is our balance sheet. Our balance sheet includes our assets, our liabilities, and our fund balances. Each month, we like to take a look at our cash and investments. We'll take a look here, concentrating on our general fund. We have cash on hand of $13,300. We have bank deposits of $558,000. We have investments in our state pools of $41.6 million. Investments in Wood Forest National Bank of $30.3 million. Short-term investments, that's investments less than one year. 29.7 million and our longer term investments uh, with TCG Investment Advisors of 52 million for total cash and investments of 154.1 million dollars. We can also look at our property tax collections. I just wanted to show this because apparently one of the large uh, mortgage companies did make a payment in October. Usually they, those don't start coming in until <laughs> November, but I just wanted to show that this year we did receive a large payment. The next statement we'll look at is our income statement. 
Our income statement includes our revenues and expenditures for the district. Revenues are broken down into three categories. That's local and intermediate sources, state program revenues, and federal program revenues. Just taking a quick look at our local and intermediate sources, you can see all the different categories that we receive funds for for each one of our funds. We can also take a look at our year-to-date expenditures by major category. Once again, payroll is our largest expenditure in the general fund. <clears throat> this is our 2015 bond referendum status. This includes our school, our school referendum of $487 million, along with the $41.4 million that the board has contributed to support this program. Our funds exp are currently expended and encumbered are $487.3 million. We have an estimate to complete our program of $37.4 million, giving us a project forecast of $524 million. That's currently leaving us with about $3.7 million worth of contingency. However, we do have several several projects that are now in the closeout, closeout stage, so we should see some return from those. Uh, Self-funded insurance, uh, total revenues for the year, $8.3 million. Our, our expenses, $7.8 million. Uh, currently, revenues over expenses of $475,000. Uh, uncharacteri uncharacteristically, October is usually a positive month for us, but we wow. have been experiencing very high claims based on high dollar claims, individual claims that are that are in excess of $50,000 a piece. So we have a lot of experience there, so uh, we're monitoring that as, as we go forward. Uh, participation at our wellness centers. Uh, as you can see, people have been visiting our clinics. Um, for the month of October, we had 608 uh, patients visit our clinics. Uh, that's a total of 1,120 so far this year. <clears throat> our investments for the month, the par value of our total portfolio is $365.9 million. Our pools are yielding 2.32%. Our investments at Wood Forest National Bank, 2.41%. Our shorter term investments, 1.98%. Our longer term investments with TCG Investment Advisors, 1.7%, giving us a combined portfolio that has a WAM of 48 days, yielding 2.25%. And that is right in line currently with our benchmark, which is the 90 day T bill, is also at 2.25%. I think that's the first time, though, that we've been right at the same target. Yes, sir, it is. Yeah. So, and TCG still helping us out on refinancing or? Yeah, yeah. There, you know, with with the with the change in the interest rates, there's just no opportunity to sell any because we'd no, be selling at just a loss. Right. No, so we don't want to do that. You know, it's just it's just the environment of you know when interest rates are rising, shorter term investments are going to be more yep. you know right. uh, you know more that you want yeah, concerning yeah, yeah. versus yeah. if it was declining. I so. understand. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Thank you. Closed session of the board will now be held on matters contained in the notice of this meeting as authorized by section 551.072 and section 551.074 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such close or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be at either this public meeting upon the reconvening of this public meeting or at a subsequent public meeting of, of the board upon notice thereof as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. It is now 8.04 p.m. Gotcha. You have to have that webinar done.